Hi everyone, welcome to Project Echo Geriatrics. Happy Friday. Um, today we have a fantastic speaker, which if you've been participating in Echo, you will um, recognize Zach Markham, who is also often a panelist, usually a panelist um, as our geriatric pharmacist on the panel. He is a superlative expert in geriatric pharmacology, does lots of research and education related to it. And he is going to talk to us about some of the age-related changes to pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. And some of you might be thinking back to medical school and maybe having some post-traumatic <laughs> stress related to thinking about such things. Um, but it's really under-covered. In, it's not covered well in medical school curriculum, and um, we don't really usually dig into it in residency, so I thought this would be helpful for all of us who are practicing caring for older adults to really review the age-related changes and think about how it might impact our prescribing for older adults. So thank you, Zach. All right, thanks, Kate. Um, so we're gonna do pharmacology on a Friday, so get excited. Um, there's really just two main areas that I'd like to cover, the impact of age-related PK and PD changes, and then some of the most common and important considerations that we need to make when managing medications in older adults. Um, so to start with, let's define what we mean by PK and PD. So these are pretty simple definitions. Um, so PK is basically what your body does with a medication, and PD is what the medication does to your body. Um, in PK, there are four main steps. Um, ADME is the acronym that we typically use. There's absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. And I'll go into those in more detail on the subsequent slides. And then PD, is really what we think of when we think of a clinical response. And that could either be a good thing for effectiveness or a bad thing for toxicity. So this figure here shows a very simple pharmacokinetic process for an orally ingested drug. You can see it's ingested, it's absorbed, um, it goes through first pass in the liver, then it enters the systemic circulation and is distributed throughout the body. Most commonly it's metabolized by the liver and then eliminated most commonly by the kidneys. This figure here puts both processes together. So you have the pharmacokinetic steps up on top and the pharmacodynamic steps on bottom, where the drug is absorbed in the um, systemic circulation, reaches its site of action, and exhibits its pharmacologic effect. And again, that can either be toxicity or effectiveness. So just a quick show of hands as a review, um, which pharmacokinetic parameter do you think is the least affected by age-related physiological changes of those four steps that I mentioned. Um, so just raise your hand for the answer as I call them out. So how many people think it's A, absorption? B, distribution? C, metabolism? And D, excretion? All right, so I think I saw the most hands for B, distribution. Um, the correct answer is A, absorption. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit on the next slide. Um, when you think about the one that's most affected, it's probably D, excretion. Um, so just keep in mind absorption, while important, is probably the least affected by age-related changes. So these are the physiologic changes that take place with aging in terms of um, the gastric um, system. The consequences, though, are, are relatively minor. So there's a potential for a delay in the absorption of medications, but there's typically no change in the extent of absorption. Um, because most drugs are absorbed through passive diffusion, which is not affected by, by aging. However, there are some key considerations. For example, calcium carbonate can experience decreased absorption because it needs an acidic environment. And we see that with aging, um, there's an increase in the gastric pH, leading to a more basic environment. Um, and with that, you can have an increased risk of constipation. And so one simple solution would be to switch to calcium citrate that can dissolve more easily in a less acidic environment. But on the whole, um, absorption is, is not really that affected by age-related changes. Again, the rate could be delayed, but the extent is not significantly changed. For distribution, um, things are a little bit more complicated. So with aging, we have a decrease in total body water, which leads to a decrease in the volume of distribution for hydrophilic drugs, like ethanol and lithium, and we'll talk about what that means on the next slide. There's also a decrease in lean body mass, so there will be a decrease in volume of distribution for drugs that bind to muscle, like digoxin. Um, in addition, there's an increase in fat stores relative to lean body mass, 
And so we will see an increased volume of distribution for lipophilic drugs like daisepam. And then finally, there's generally a decrease in albumin. So drugs that are highly protein bound will have a greater uh, percentage that um, are in the systemic circulation unbound and therefore able to um, exert their pharmacologic effect. So distribution is altered due to age-related physiologic changes. Um, the two most common takeaways here are that lipid-soluble drugs may show an increased volume of distribution due to that increase in body fat. So the patient will experience a longer <coughs> half-life and increased risk for side effects, for example, with diazepam. And then water-soluble drugs will show a decreased volume of distribution, which can lead to a higher drug concentration and increased risk for side effects. So either way, whether it's hydrophilic or lipophilic, there could be problems with aging. As far as metabolism goes, there are quite a few changes that occur with aging. Um, and the consequences um, are important to think about the phases. So phase one is typically what we think of when we talk about the cytochrome P450 system. They're oxidative and reductive pathways. Phase two um, is typically less affected by aging, but in frail older adults, it can be impacted. Um, and so this slide here shows the two main pathways. So phase one um, basically breaks down a drug into metabolites that can either have less, equal, or greater activity than the parent drug, just depending on the drug. And again, this is the cytochrome P450 system that we commonly think about with drug-drug interactions. And then phase two converts the parent drug to inactive metabolites. Some examples of drugs that are metabolized through this pathway are the benzos listed there. And while we generally try to avoid benzos in older adults, these are the three, LOT is how we typically remember them, that would be preferred, and this is the reason why, because they're um, metabolized in this pathway that leads to an inactive metabolite preventing accumulation. And this footnote here just says that, that same message, that medications that undergo phase two metabolism are generally preferred. So again, we prefer phase two mechanisms. Um, for drugs that are metabolized by phase one, generally we wanna use a lower dose and then adjust based on response and tolerability. And it's really important to consider, of course, drug-drug interactions um, particularly among patients on multiple medications, which many of our patients are. Finally, for excretion, um, again, this is probably the most affected stage um, within PK processes. Um, so the take-home message here is that renal elimination of drugs can be impaired, extending the, the drug's half-life. So it can stay around longer, it can accumulate, and it can exert um, side effects. Two examples, so here's digoxin. The half-life is about 38 to 48 hours in a normal healthy adult, and on average it's about 70 hours in older adults. So it's really important to keep this in mind when you're dosing digoxin in an older adult. And then also ranitidine, so rather than being used 150 milligrams twice a day, um, in an older adult with a creatinine clearance less than 50, we'd wanna reduce that dose. So again, decreased renal clearance of drugs is the most significant age-related change in PK, and it's probably the one that you're most um, commonly encountering in your clinical practice because you're constantly receiving alerts um, in the system and calls from the pharmacist asking you to renally dose drugs. And then switching gears a little bit, for PD, um, this is actually probably more <coughs> clinically significant, but we know less about pharmacodynamic interactions in older adults. Um, and it's not entirely clear why they occur. Some changes um, have been suggested, including different um, receptor numbers or affinity with aging, but it's not entirely clear. We just know that they do occur. Um, the clinical implications are most commonly seen in the CNS and cardiovascular systems. And I've listed some of the most common and clinically important pharmacodynamic changes as they relate to medication management in older adults. So we see, of course, that older adults are more sensitive to benzos, opioids, alcohol, anticholinergics, and some cardiac drugs like digoxin. So tying it all together, we have here the drug that's given, um, the PK processes take place, um, the drug then reaches its site of action where it exerts its PD effect, and then for efficacy, um, ideally we'd have our desirable therapeutic outcome, but that can of course be impacted by adherence and other disease characteristics. So I think it's helpful when you're reading about different medications to keep in mind um, where some of these concepts fall in this paradigm to help you remember.
So how do we use this information? So one common thing that we oftentimes um, interact with is the Beers criteria. So when you're reading something in the Beers criteria, again, think about what this means. Is it a PK consideration? Is it a PD consideration? So this is one here of uh, anticholinergics, which of course we should try to avoid in older adults. And the rationale I've highlighted is that its clearance is reduced with advanced age. So that's suggesting a, a PK consideration. And then moving on, there's a risk of confusion, dry mouth, constipation. That's leaning more towards a PD consideration, which I mentioned um, on the PD slide, because older adults are more sensitive to anticholinergic side effects. So again, I think if you can keep this paradigm in mind, it'll help you remember some of these common um, clinically important uh, considerations. As far as a PD consideration within the Beers criteria, they have this table of drug-drug interactions, and essentially this is all pointing toward the concept of CNS active polypharmacy. So you should try to avoid using essentially three or more CNS active drugs in a given patient. Um, and this again is a, a pharmacodynamic interaction. And at the end of the day, um, just looking at a simple medication list, it would be great to be able to start to prioritize um, with these PKPD considerations in mind, what are the most important things that I need to be thinking about? So doses aside, patient conditions aside, just knowing that you're caring for an older adult, you look at this list, um, what are some things that come to mind? I'll give you just a few seconds to think. All right, so when I look at this list, so starting with PK, um, again, elimination is the most common one that we think of. So what are some drugs that might need to be renally dosed? So gabapentin is one, um, digoxin is one. So those are the two that kind of stand out to me. From a pharmacodynamic perspective, I see a lot of CNS active medications. So we have citalopram, clonazepam, Vicodin, Zolpidem, gabapentin. Um, so here, you know, these are the things that would kind of rise to the top. There are, of course, many other considerations and there's a lot of pharmacological trivia that you can get into in terms of drug-drug interactions, but I think it's important to just keep in mind the most common ones to, to prioritize where you want to go um, in the absence of doses, in the absence of um, health conditions. So I would challenge you when you're looking at medication list to try to start to think about these um, common considerations. And then finally, um, these concepts are universal. So as new drugs come on the market, um, I think if you, if you keep these in mind, you can kind of um, understand better about how a drug might perform in an older adult. So this is just a, a hypothetical mock new drug. It's a sedative hypnotic that's coming out on the market. Of course, most of the studies have been performed in young middle-aged patients with short duration. It's known that the drug is primarily metabolized via oxidation and demethylation in the liver by CYP3A4 to inactive metabolites and there's very little renal excretion of the unchanged drug. The mechanism is through um, interaction with GABA receptors at binding domains located close to benzos receptors in the CNS. So what are the main differences that you might expect for this drug when treating a 92-year-old frail elderly patient with insomnia? So again, starting from the top, pharmacokinetically, absorption is probably not that impacted. Um, the drug could be distributed. Um, we don't know about its um, hydrophilicity or lipophilicity. Um, in terms of metabolism, we do know that it's primary met primarily metabolized by 3A4, so we could anticipate that this patient would be less effective at breaking it down, which would suggest we would probably want to use a lower dose. And then elimination, we see here that it's eliminated um, at a very low proportion, unchanged in the urine, so we probably wouldn't need to renally adjust this drug. And then from a pharmacodynamic perspective, we, we see that it acts like a benzo, so we can anticipate that our patient would probably be more sensitive and, again, would suggest a lower dose and closer monitoring, especially given that the patient is frail. That, that definitely increases the risk as well. So kind of keeping these concepts in mind, I think, can take you a long way for understanding existing drugs and new drugs as they come on the market. So with that, um, I want to acknowledge my colleague, Emily, at BCU um, for sharing some of these slides, and I'm happy to take any questions.